Oh, will this work? <laughs> will I be? Oh, greetings and salutations, imagination connoisseurs. It looks, it looks like I'm actually live. Well, hello, imagination connoisseurs. It is I, the notoriously sanctimonious RMB that has been going through, well, you know, let's put first world problems, trying to get this YouTube channel to work. Apparently, there was a lot of shenanigans going on with YouTube. I don't know exactly what was happening, but um, stuff was happening. And uh, I couldn't get on. I couldn't even log in. I set up my chat uh, early this morning, well, earlier this morning, and uh, I thought all was well, getting ready to go on. And then I couldn't get back into my YouTube channel. You know, but ultimately, remember, the entire internet is luxury. It's a luxury item. It's a luxury item for all of us because, you know, most people in the world are still worrying about where they're going to sleep at night and where they're going to get their food. And, and we, of course, we have the internet, which is a great thing. But when it goes down, we go all crazy, like Heath, Leather's Joker, Heath Ledger's Joker might say. But it looks like I am live. And that is fantastic. Welcome to this, the 135th live observations chat with you, the imagination connoisseurs of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. And I welcome all of you. And apparently, YouTube has been changing all of their analytics. So if I could ask you a favor, if you like these chats, to please click the like button, not just on this one, but on any of them. Go back through all of them. Subscribe if you want. If you don't want, you think I'm a monumental douchebag, don't hit like. But even if you do, you're still watching, hit like anyway. I guess hitting those likes will be helpful going forward into the future. So if you want to subscribe and you like the channel, it helps me deal with my YouTube analytics. And other things I'm also going to do is people have contacted me about, they send in super chats, they don't want to wait so after I read everyone's letters, I'll look at Super Chats coming in and try and make it much more community friendly because that's what I'm trying to do for you. And guess what? I, as you all know, love letters, love getting letters from you. And I actually have my first, amazingly enough, look at this. I have a real letter. I have a real letter. It's my first letter. It's actually the second piece of mail I ever received. Uh... The first piece of mail I ever received, I want to say, uh, comes from Joe Long. Thank you, Joe. Uh-oh, there's my address. Uh, actually, it's my P.O. box in Bettendorf, Iowa. But I want to say that Joe Long actually sent me a birthday card. And I want to thank Joe for doing that. Uh, he, he sent me a birthday quote. He said, happy birthday to you and an even happier year ahead. So thank you, Joe. He said, my birthday quote is... There are two great days in a person's life, the day we are born and the day we discover why. What a great quote by William Barclay. Uh, so thank you for that, Joe. And this other letter that I received, which has kind of left me a little bit melancholy, I have to say. <clears throat> it comes from Tony Washburn, a.k.a. Destiny Captain. Rob, hey. I just wanted to send this along to you. Feel free to do with it as you wish. Keep it, trash it, whatever. I'm in the process of purging all of my Trek stuff. This represents a Trek fan film series that I wanted to do back in 2007. This was the insignia of the USS Destiny in the TOS era. That project never went anywhere as it was just me. By the time we got to the Axnar lawsuit and to the new fan film rules of 2016, it was finally, completely, dead. I'm purging the Trek stuff because, as I've mentioned in the chats before, that the state of Trek has declined so far in the last few years that I really have lost all interest in it. I was a fan since 74 or 75 when I was 4 or 5. I've raised four adult children on Trek, three girls and a boy. We watched all the shows, we went to the movies, we had great long talks about Trek, we bought lots of Trek stuff. Anywho, I really appreciate your show and what you do. Many days, it's the high point of my day. Take care, Tony Washburn, a.k.a. Destiny Captain from Lubbock, Texas. Well, first of all, Tony, 
I want to thank you. Uh, what he sent me, he sent me these insignia patches that I would imagine would, would have gone on the breasts of those characters. He sent me three. They're really well done. And, and here they are. Oh, let me let me show that to you. I mean, this is this is really nice work, and I really like this insignia. So I guess I'm actually wearing an into darkness shirt. You know, it's terrible. I'm doing it, but so you can see it. You know, I guess we'll be on. But uh, really like this insignia. I think it's really well done. And you know, Tony, I I I I, I kind of feel melancholy about it because you know, <laughs> for all the shenanigans with Axnar, which are continuing to go on for me, but you know. The Axnar project began with the best of intentions, and I know that's how the road to hell is paved. But for anyone, I have to say I'm still very proud of the work I did on Prelude to Axnar, and I'm very proud of the work I did on the Vulcan scene and developing the Axnar feature film, the never-to-be-made Axnar feature film. And if you go to my website, um, thebrunettework.net, and you go to Deconstructing Axnar, which is a page, there are three documentaries that I made of the work that I was doing for the Axnar feature film before it was curtailed and work was stopped. So I uh, I suggest you go to those and check them out. I'm still very uh, proud of the work that we did. Now, I have a bunch of other letters. Uh, I got a letter that really tickles me to no end because, as many of you know, on my website, thebrunetwork.net, we have the Imagination Connoisseur Gallery. And I love it when people send stuff. And if you have tattoos, if you have artwork, if you have short stories or movies or anything, just fill out the submission form for the Imagination Connoisseur Gallery. And we'd like to put one of those, uh, your work up, whatever that might be. Now, one of the first things that came in and one of the things that I think is, is, is the coolest is a woman has basically an Avengers motorcycle. I mean, it's badass. It's like Captain America Avengers motorcycle. And it's really cool. I mean, and it's totally current all the way up to Endgame. It's, it's, I mean, it's a beautiful motorcycle. One of the things I've always wanted to do in my life is learn how to ride a motorcycle. Uh, I've never done it before. I've ridden mopeds and things like that, but never a motorcycle. This motorcycle is dope. It's very cool. Check it out. But I just got a letter from the owner of that motorcycle, Danny Lane. So this comes from Danny Lane herself. Hi, Rob. I found your YouTube channel after listening to you on the John Campia show. I'm continually amazed by your wealth of knowledge on movies and science fiction. But what I appreciate the most is that you've created a space that feels inclusive, safe, and welcoming. I just love your jovial and optimistic outlook, and I really like listening to you read letters from your listeners and responding to them. I sent you pictures of my motorcycle, and I heard you mention that on your show, and I was tickled. That is because, good good madam, your motorcycle is the ultimate in badassery, and I salute you. Uh, that's why I was tickled, because <laughs> it's awesome. I also found through listening to you that we have some obscure things in common. One is Buckaroo Bonsai. The vanity plate for my previous motorcycle was BBI for Blue Blaze Irregular. Somewhere in a storage box, I have a packet from 20th Century Fox with my Blue Blaze Irregular registration number on it, and I still have a Buckaroo Bonsai headband hanging from the rearview mirror in my car. I read that Kevin Smith was working on a sequel or a remake of Buckaroo Bonsai, but that there was a conflict between D.W. Richter, McRouch, and the studio, so it may never happen. That's a shame because Buckaroo is a hero for these times. <laughs> Remember, wherever you go, there you are. The second thing was General Hospital. You don't often hear soap operas mentioned in the same breath as Avengers, Star Trek, and Star Wars. I love the stories with Frisco and Felicia, Sean Donnelly and Robert Scorpio, and Anna Devane. <laughs> this was all taking place just after the Prometheus disc story. Do you remember that there was an alien named Casey on General Hospital? I don't. That had to have predated me. I would be so frustrated because it was such a cool idea and the writers didn't know how to handle the sci-fi aspect. <laughs> but I digress. I was listening today when you were talking about the movie rating system. Back in 1984, I had taken my daughter to see Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. She was five. During the scene when Mola Ram reaches into the sacrifice's chest and pulls out the beating heart, I looked down to see my baby covering her eyes. I felt 
like the worst bomb in the world. I do think I recall the movie rating changing at the time. Fast forward to this year in Shazam. I took my 10-year-old granddaughter and my 6-year-old grandson. During the film, when the smoke was coalescing into the frightful monsters, I felt my grandson bury his face in my arm. I looked over to my granddaughter and she had her hand over her eyes. Now I feel like the worst grandma in the world. I'm definitely going to be more sensitive to their ages when I pick out movies for them from now on. I will be taking them again this week and I let them pick ugly dolls. Here I come. <laughs> Thanks for the great YouTube channel. I really love listening. Well, Danny, thank you for that. Thank you for sending in the motorcycle pictures to the post-geek singularity, well, the imagination connoisseur gallery because your motorcycle is awesome. So, hey, if for no other reason, go to my website, go to thebrunetwork.net and check out Danny's motorcycle because it is truly badass and I love it. Uh, here's another one. This one comes from Adam Talley. Hello, Rob. This is Adam, a.k.a. Idiot Head from the chats. I don't get to participate live often, but I listen to every show. Thank you for creating a great positive place where discussion can happen, as well as giving voices to those who need to express such positivity in what is sometimes a very dark world. Good to know we have a home. I became a fan of yours when I saw Free Enterprise in the late 90s. The movie spoke to me in so many ways. I grew up a geek and a massive Trek fan, but this was a movie that didn't show much of that stereotypical pathetic virgin nerd that most movies do. I was a geek who hit the clubs, drank, chased girls, and got them. Quite a few hot and spicy Irish salsa numbers. No Kermit the Frog numbers, though. A fantasy yet to fulfill. All the while, endlessly dropping movie and Star Trek quotes. For these reasons and more, Free Enterprise ranks in my personal top 20 movies of all time, if not top 10. I truly mean that. Thank you for making it, and congrats to you and Mark on its anniversary. It doesn't get near enough attention as it should. I agree with that. Thanks to your show, I've gotten back into the habit of reading more. I recently scored Dune, and I'm giving it a read soon. But right now, I still have a pile of Harlan Ellison books I'm working through. Good on you. Uh, currently also on a mission to collect every single Trek, vintage, and pocket books for the original series. I'm almost there. I read a lot of them as a kid. And it will be great to revisit them and fill in the gaps for those I did not. Also, you and the friends on the channel have inspired me to drop some coin on my first Sideshow Toys figure. I got the Jedi Luke Deluxe, as he was always my favorite version of Luke. Should arrive next week, and I cannot wait to get it. I hope it doesn't become an addiction quite yet. Trying to save for a wedding. Well, good for you. Maybe I should add a glass case like yours to the registry. <laughs> Laugh out loud, as the kids would say. Just wanted to drop a line and say thanks for all these things, such as inspiring me to indulge my arrested adolescent behavior and knowing it can truly be okay to collect and buy such things at my middle age. Oh, I assure you, sir, it is. <laughs> you inspire the positive inner child in all of us, and thanks for doing what you do. Adam T. Idiothead.com. P.S. I so envy Willow. Watching TOS for the first time, Star Trek truly has made my life great. How? Well, that's another letter to come. Cheers. Well, Adam, thank you so much. That was a great letter. I loved, uh, loved hearing from you. Uh, very much enjoyed that. Um, you know, it's funny you talk about Star Trek books. Now, for a lot of people, uh, you know, Star Trek books are kind of a weird, I don't know. They think, I, I, as a kid, I started reading Star Trek books because there was never going to be any new Star Trek. So Star Trek books, novels were the way to me, for me to experience more adventures. Now, you know, we had, of course, the Star Trek logs that Alan Dean Foster wrote, which were expanded novelizations of the animated series. We had the 12 James Blish books uh, that his wife, J.A. Lawrence, finished off. And then we had the novels, the Bantam novels. We had first, there was Spock Must Die, there was Spock Messiah, there was David Gerald's The Galactic Whirlpool, Gordon Eklund's The Starless World, Joe Haldeman's The World Without End, Kathleen Skye's Vulcan with the Giant Ants. So I read these books in the 70s as a kid, and I loved them. Some I loved more than others. I was not a big fan of Kathleen Skye's Vulcan. And then, of course, famously, when Star Trek The Motion Picture came out, um, 
pocketbooks took over and there's a whole new publishing empire and uh, novels, hundreds and hundreds to this day. And they're coming out, as a matter of fact, they've actually once again reformatted the Star Trek novels. They're no longer standard paperback size. They're like trade paperbacks now. And coincidentally, I got two in the mail yesterday from Amazon. I got this from one of my favorite Star Trek novelists. Really, most of his books are absolutely terrific. His first one that he that I read was actually a sequel to Star Trek The Motion Picture called Ex Machina. Uh, this is Christopher L. Bennett's new book, The Captain's Oath. Yes, sir, The Captain's Oath. Very excited to dig in. Love Christopher Bennett's work. And then a longtime Star Trek novelist and favorite of mine as well, Dayton Ward wrote this Next Generation book, Available Light, which comes on the heels, directly on the heels of David Mack's uh, Star Trek Section 31 novel, Control, that they shamelessly ripped off on Star Trek Discovery without giving him any credit, which, when you think about it, is absolutely astonishing that they actually ripped off a Star Trek novelist and didn't give him any credit which is shocking. Anyway, uh, still a big fan, but I love getting your letter and I can't wait to hear what you think of the Luke figure that you got. So we shall see. And uh, let's see, uh, what do we got here? We've got um, Brian Cruz is here, who's written me letters before. Brian Cruz, thanks for supporting the channel. Uh, he says, Brian Cruz says, so bummed about Godzilla's box office. Now the question is, will it even break even? I have to get it needs 400 to 500 million just to do that. Don't be that depressed. Let's see how it does in the international markets. I read it's almost past 200 million internationally. I think it's going to do well in Japan and China. I'm I'm depressed too because look, that that Rotten Tomato score, the audience loved it. It was up to 90% even though the critical uh, establishment didn't like it. I I love the film. I as I I talked about, I think it it has it's it's a, a perfect homage to all the the Toho movies and and um, you know I, I just think that stylistically it right now we're going we don't have a lot of time for whimsy in our sci-fi although I'll be curious to see what people's response to Good Omens is because um, that has a lot of whimsy curious to see how that's going to go so Brian I hope it uh, I hope it makes more money we'll see I really do uh, this one comes from Cody Hart. Hi, Rob. I often hear on your show you talk of your love for physical media and collecting movies. Whether it be mass release titles or an obscure gem film, this makes me think of my love for collecting cinema as well, which is a love passed on to me from my father. I can remember being a child and sneaking downstairs well past bedtime and grabbing DVD after DVD of movies that I wasn't supposed to be watching. <laughs> and then watching them religiously in my room until I wanted a different film to watch. This brings me to my two questions. The first being that I would and still can watch a film over and over again because the entertainment value is always there for me. I feel this is lost today. With the streaming services, phones, and in general all available media, I constantly see the younger generations often unwilling to watch a movie again because why would they? This brings me to my second question collecting. I still get excited and antsy waiting for that new film to arrive at my front door, whether it be from a, an obscure video label like 88 Films, who put out Inframan and Two Moon Junction, Vinegar Syndrome, who dropped that beautiful, beautiful Liquid Sky disc, or even just receiving the newest release, Inglorious 4K, right there with you. I think I've got Captain Marvel comes out next week, in 4K, I pre-ordered the Steelbook from Best Buy. I feel as though this passion of collecting is lost upon the new generation as well. They aren't collectors, nor seem interested in the idea of collecting anything physical, because why would they? All in all, my questions boil down to this. Can this new generation have the same passion for cinema, whether old or new, as we did in the past and still do today? Growing up for us, the movie was the go-to form of entertainment. Today, that is simply not the case. We do see big budget films succeed in the public eye, but will these people ever care to discover the glory that is a demon wind or the executioner or even a classic like Dawn of the Dead? 
Do these movies, collecting ideals, and rewatchability have a life after our generation? Thanks. Well, Cody, um, that is, uh, yeah, such such. It's such a topic that I, um, I, I I'm constantly uh, grappling with, and and I think you did answer your own question in a certain sense, and that no. You know the world. The world, as it always does, evolves and moves on, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think the problem now is that we have a generation, a new generation, as with all generations, that is slightly different than the generation that preceded it. And I think that one of those things is where this generation gets their entertainment. First and foremost, we live the, the younger generation for the very first time. They're actually the protagonists in their own evolving stories that are being told on Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Well, maybe not Facebook so much anymore for the younger generation. But we do have a group of people that are getting all their information and, and they're, they're literally crafting their own narratives about themselves online. And once you've become the center of your own story, I think it's harder to step out of yourself and be interested in protagonists that are involved in other stories that don't necessarily impact you. Um, that's why I think gaming, again, video games have become so much more sophisticated and so much more advanced in the last 25 years. And I too feel the pull of, of video games are, are quite enticing. And when you're watching a narrative, the first time I've talked about this before, but when I played Uncharted for the first time, the first Uncharted, I really felt that I was for the first time I was following a narrative, even though I was playing the different levels, the cut scenes and the acting and the characters was a narrative that I felt invested in. And I was advancing the narrative myself. I mean, even though I wasn't the protagonist, it was Nathan Drake was the protagonist. And I, I, I still was, was captivated by his plight and, and his situation. And I was literally forwarding the plot for him. And I, I, I realized for the first time that that motion picture narratives are are now under threat. And and look, that's what's happened throughout history. I think movies are never going to go away. People are always going to like narratives because people still read books, people still go to plays, people still go to the ballet, but they've been supplanted. Movies were sort of to me, movies were the art form of the 20th century. Um they were they were uh, byproducts of technology that didn't exist up until that point when they finally figured out how to run. I mean, what is a movie but a, a, a succession? It's not so much true in the digital capture era, but in terms of the film era, it was a succession of still photographs that were projected at 24 frames a second. Before that, it was 18 or whatever, 12. But at 24 frames a second, to create the illusion of movement and our, our own bodies, persistence of vision, the idea of persistence of vision, the way our, our minds and our eyes perceive things, they were able to create motion pictures or the perception of motion. And that's why they became motion pictures. But, you know, we're, we're evolving as we always are. And I think where we're going to wind up is we are going to be at the center of the entertainments that we're going to get in the future once VR technology increases. And uh, it's just changing. It's just changing. And I think the new generation, they're on the cusp of getting these, these things. And while movies, I think for most younger people, especially millennials or generation now, what generation Z, uh, these, these younger, younger, younger whippersnappers just have more entertainment options available to them. And hell, heck, YouTube never existed. I mean, I never thought that there would come a day where I've done 135 live chats myself on YouTube. I mean, it's funny. I don't, I don't have, uh, my channel is also pretty embryonic, I would say. I mean, I've got 11,700 subscribers. By the way, if you're not a subscriber, please hit that subscribe button. It'd help me out and hit like if you like this chat. But it's just a new world, and, and content is now available so many different places. Do I lament the fact that movies are lo no longer the cultural force that they used to be? You know, probably, probably. But, you know, we grew up in a time where movies mattered and they matter differently than they matter now. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I like having a collection of films, but even I have sort of slowed down. I, I, I often thought that my own movie collection, which probably hovers somewhere around 
2,500 films, um, mostly Blu-rays, but of course DVDs, and I even have some Laserdiscs. I don't think I have anything on Laserdisc anymore that I haven't replaced on some other format. But, you know, I've got, I've got let's say I have 2,500 movies. And I've talked about this before on the show, right? But so I've got 2,500 films. Let's say, let's just, for the sake of argument, well, 2,500 discs, but some are TV shows. But let's say for the sake of argument, they're two hours. I know a lot of movies are, are 90 minutes. But what is 2,500 times two hours? That's 5,000 hours. 5,000 hours. And uh, if, if, if you've got 5,000 hours of movies, right? Now, how much time do I have left in my life before I'm dead? So there's 5,000 hours of movies that I already own. So if I go back, how long would that take with 24 hours in a day? I mean, if I had, if I watched a movie a week or two of my collection uh, a week for the rest of my life, uh, who knows how long that would take? Uh, I don't know, but I'd have to do the quick math. Um, I'll leave that up for you to decide. But collecting movies now has gotten to the point where I look at my movie collection. I love that. I love my movie collection, but I'm like, my God, when am I going to ever watch these movies again? They seem so important. And how many movies have I bought? I mean, getting Star Wars. And how, I wrote an article once for a magazine how many times I bought Star Wars. And it's probably doubled since I wrote the article right, right after The Phantom Menace has come out. But look, I love collecting movies. I love watching movies over and over and over again. Because for me, the movies that I love, if I watch an Almost Famous or a Dawn of the Dead or To Live and Die in L.A. or The Godfather or all that jazz, movies I like and watch always. The characters in those movies are like my friends, and you know you revisit them. I just don't think people now have that same kind of a mindset. They're doing other things. It's just different. Uh, do I lament that? Yeah, I kind of do. Um, um, I, but I, again, it's just different. I, I think collecting movies was great. I think having movies that that you come back to as comfort food are great. Uh, but I think it's just a different, I think it's a different thing. I think we live in a different world now and it's in a world that's constantly evolving. And I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. I mean, I think that every generation should have their own, their own deal. I, I really do. I think that's, I think it's important. And, um, while I, I wish people would still collect movies, they don't, I mean, hell, we're losing iTunes this week. That's, uh, I don't know what that means. I mean, some people have said iTunes was never that stable. I don't know, but now it's going to be split into what, three different three different apps? <laughs> it all changes. I, I know that, look, it, I'm, the movie Demon uh, Lover is coming to me, starring Connie Nielsen, is coming to me from Arrow UK. It will show up. I'm happy to have it. Never owned it. Happy to have it. I'm going to watch it when I get the discs, watch any special features, and put it up on my shelf. I don't know if I'll ever revisit it. I hope somebody will come over and I can show it to them. But um, it's it's interesting. I just think that it's just different. Every generation has different things, and we shouldn't we should never go like, oh, woe is them. Woe is the generation, you know, that that came after us. It's all different. Everybody's different, and it's an evolutionary process. But damn, I love my physical media. I love my action figures. I love my model kits. I love my busts. You know, love it all. John Suntress is here from the Word Balloon Podcast. I did a pretty rollicking three-hour podcast with him the other day. When it goes up, I will send you a link. John asks, did you like the video ad adaptation of Mind Sifter? Um, well, uh, that, okay, first of all, Mind Sifter, what John has asked me about is Mark Edward Lewis, who I work with on the Prelude to Axnar film. He directed a Star Trek The New Voyages uh, or Star Trek Phase Two. What I don't know what, what what was it? Star Trek: The New Voyages, the fan film group that James James Colley's group that's now become legal and licensed with their Star Trek set tour, original series set tour. He directed an adaptation of the story Mind Sifter that came from the first New Voyages anthology that was edited by Sandra Marshak and Myrna Colbraith uh, back in the seventies. I think it came out in seventy six. My mom packed it in my suitcase when I went off to summer camp to Camp Orkyla. And I, I love Mind Sifter. It's one of my favorite uh, pieces of Star Trek fiction. I liked it. I thought it was pretty good. You know, it, it, it wasn't bad for what it was. I thought that uh, Mark, who's not an experienced director, did a pretty good job. And uh, I did. I, 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 I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Yes, I did. Uh, Mark C is here. Longtime viewer, supporter of the channel. Mark C says... 
I wish Lucasfilm would release a 4K theatrical cut of Star Wars. I have bought every single version of that film, like a Manchurian candidate buys Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> okay, you guys got to watch. If you haven't seen John Frankenheimer's movie from the 60s, John Frankenheimer was one of the great uh, film directors. And in the 60s, he was a powerhouse director. And he made a lot of what I would consider vaguely science fiction movies the manchurian candidate being one of them his most overt science fiction film seconds that starred salome jens along with rock hudson but salome jens was the lead founder in deep space nine uh but he he uh, made the manchurian candidate which is one of my favorite movies of all time that was based on a novel that kennedy loved uh it's such a great film but yes i think they should release a 4k version of the original star wars but as people have uh i mean i have a restoration of the original Star Wars. What is the the negative one group? Uh, I have it right here. I have I have a couple versions, fan made versions of the original versions of Star Wars in 4K. Uh, I can't burn the 4K to disc. I've burned Blu-rays, but I can't burn it to a 4K disc. But yes, I think Disney should release them. They might not ever, but I do believe it has something to do with the fact that. It's of my opinion and the opinion of other learned people that the reason George Lucas, part of the reason he created the special editions was also he wanted to make new versions of Star Wars and not have to keep paying his wife ungodly sums of money, Marsha Lucas. And that's why he gave away the versions of the original Star Wars on one of the releases of the special editions. He, he put the Laserdisc Masters on the DVDs. They weren't anamorphic, but he just gave them away. I'd like to see the... Uh, versions come out. I'd love to see 4K releases because I can't, I can't watch the special edition of Star Wars. There's no verisimilitude, going from the CG to the non-CG, um, and it bums me out. And um, yeah, so <laughs> uh, and Willow Yang is here. Willow Yang says she watched the Omega Glory. Which, by the way, here's an interesting... Uh, oh, the Omega Glory is a not very well-regarded episode of the original series with the the Combs and the Yangs. It is uh, with Captain Ron Tracy, a uh, crazed Star Trek commander who's... Uh, Star Trek, a crazed, a crazed Starship commander, a heavy cruiser. Starship commander whose, whose crew was crystallized after they beamed back up from a planet. They had to go back down and... And uh, Ron Tracy is basically using Federation technology to help take over a planet. And it is it, it is one of the most head most didactic smack your head over. Uh, if in case you didn't get it, the allegory is so ridiculously overt. Uh, not a great episode of the original series. But uh, Willow Yang says, watch the Omega Glory yesterday. My jaw dropped during the last 15 minutes. What the F is happening? Well, Willow. Where's your review? Love to uh, love to read that review of yours and see what you have to say. Square Wheel says, did you find out what that loud crash was yesterday? Yes. What happened was my girlfriend, Elizabeth, We in Pasadena, there's um, this weekend, there is an artist's open house. So you, if you have a gallery or you have a studio or you work out of your house, as Elizabeth does, you open your house and it's like an art walk. So people go through and see your paintings. And there was a cross breeze that knocked over her biggest painting and uh, which fell on, on a bar and knocked over a bunch of bottles. And it broke this horse statue that's right here that I have to fix. So uh, it was not the dogs. Do not blame the dogs. It was a cross breeze. And it was a pretty big painting. Pretty big canvas. So that's what happened yesterday. By the way, Square Wheel, I owe you, and I'm going to get to them. You sent me a super chat earlier. I was frozen out of YouTube, and you sent me a super chat yesterday that I didn't answer. So I'm going to get to those. Um, I do have another letter. This letter comes to me from James M. James M. says, before I get to the meat of my letter, I need to clarify that I am still relatively new to the channel, around two months, and I've not been able to watch the live streams because life hasn't let me. So I don't know how this letter will be received. I say that to say I do not want a big disagreement or a heated discussion to arise in the comments or live chat. Also, I want to be clear that I do not mean to be disrespectful in any way, shape, or form to anyone, and this letter is not aimed at anyone in particular. Now on to the letter. 
Like most everyone here, I love Star Trek, my favorite of the shows being the original series in Deep Space Nine, mine too. As for TNG, well, I'm still waiting for it to get good. I'm still in season three. I've been waiting on family so we can watch and discuss it together. It gets good in season three. Anyway, the thing I and my family love about Star Trek is that they do all they can to protect all life. Recently, I have seen headlines that some movie studios are trying to essentially blackmail a U.S. state into changing or stopping a, shall I say, <clears throat> controversial law that, as far as I can tell, will not affect movie making in any way. While I completely believe that every company should have the right to do what they want, what they think is best for them, I don't understand why they want to blackmail the state. If they want to leave, they should just leave and not make such a big deal about why they are leaving. I try not to comment on political things or, or SJW things or what have you. Most of it is negative and not worth the time or energy. The way I decide if something like this is worthy of the energy and time to talk about it is to ask myself, number one, does the current situation make any logical sense? If so, then two, if the roles were reversed, does it still make logical sense? If it does not make logical sense both ways, then it is worth the time and energy. In addition to your thoughts on the situation, the question I have is, do you think that if the law goes into effect that all movie companies will leave? And if so, where do you think they will go? As always, please correct me if and where I am wrong. On a slightly different topic, I think it would be good for movies and TV if studios started using the 40-acre lot for filming. Uh, that comes from James N. Well, James M., I'm uh, almost positive you are referring to many movie companies pulling out of Georgia after their controversial abortion laws. And here's the thing. I think that really the only way the, the, the real political power you can wield is economic power. And if, if certain groups feel that laws in states are contrary to their beliefs, contrary to the beliefs or the things that they believe in or espouse, then they absolutely should pull out of a state. Uh, they're wielding their economic power. You know, there's, after all, there's 50, 50 states in the United States. And while Georgia has made filming that they're very, um, with their tax rebates and with their infrastructure, Tyler Perry has built great infrastructure there. Marvel is, of course, uh, Pinewood, I believe, is in is in Atlanta. And, and Marvel has made great use of the state. If the state passes laws that are not acceptable to the powers that be that are making movies, that are spending billions of dollars in the, uh, in the state, I think it's absolutely their prerogative to pull out. And I don't think it's blackmail. Um, it's like whenever, if, if you're going to spend money and you're going to support a state and their infrastructure, you, um, if you want to wield political power and, and make real change, then that's how you do it. That's the American way. And I, I, I feel sorry for the Atlanta-based workers and creative people that might be losing jobs. Um, but perhaps if they want those jobs to come back to the state, they will lobby their politicians and their population to change those laws. And I think in a way, it's, it's, it's the American system working the way it should. Um, you know, I, 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 I've received, well, that was just a gate. It was nothing that, um, unless it was the wind, I don't know how it fell over. It was just a gate, but, um, nothing bad, but that's how, you know, that's how I, I, I've been getting a lot of, of, um, a lot of people have written to me about my stance on uh, pro-life and pro-choice, and I don't really want to make it a part of, of this channel because it, this is more entertainment-based and culture-based. And I know it's a big part of culture, but but this is much more entertainment-based. But being adopt, uh, an adoptee myself and knowing how close I came to non-existence, as many people might have heard as I recounted in my story about finding my or having my adoptive sister find me, um, my, uh, um, my position on it is clear. I mean, my mother, my biological mother was literally sitting in a waiting room waiting to have an abortion, uh, to have me aborted. And then literally at the very last minute she left and chose not to do that. But, um, you know, my, my, my thoughts and feelings on the situation have always been pretty much hundred percent pro-choice. However, 
you know, I also think that the the it is a nuanced argument, and I do think that ultimately it must be left up to the woman. I'm, I'm completely pro-choice, but that doesn't mean I am pro third trimester abortion. I, I think you can have a, a, a nuanced look at the situation. And and by the way, I don't think many people are are involved or interested or want third trimester abortions. But it's a it's a difficult issue, and I think ultimately it's one that should be left up to the individual and not mandated by the state or the federal government, because I don't think that where does that end? Where does the control of 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 a person's body end? But I am again, I am I am always somebody who is interested in the rights of the individual, and I think that's one of the great things about Western civilization is that we sort of are, um, in a way, sort of pioneering that. And it's great to live in a world where the um, that that the United States, at least up till now, we live in a world or a country where people do have those kinds of individual rights, for the most part. Uh, Mark C says, interesting to note, the National Film Registry that Lucas helped petition for refuses to accept the special edition edition of Star Wars into the registry, and nor should they. You know, the Star Wars Special Edition didn't ex exist until 20 years after Star Wars was released. And the original Star Wars was the movie that we all fell in love with. And, and for 20 years, for 20% of a, of a century, it was part of the cultural legacy. The Star Wars Special Edition is not Star Wars. It is not the movie that was released in 77. It does not represent the kind of movie that could have even been released in 1977. So, Mark C., I am with you, uh, and I, I think that um, that's correct, nor should they ever release it into, they shouldn't accept it in the National Registry, because it's it's a re-release, and it's an altered version of the original movie. So, yeah. Factual Opinion, with the Dr. Manhattan logo, which I love, says, finally, a MonsterVerse movie I enjoy. Godzilla 2 was really good, but I don't get the hype for Mothra. Sorry, Rob, my brother hated the movie. Well, your brother, you know, no one has to like the movie. How can you not get the hype for Mothra, though? Mosura! You know, let me just tell you, Mothra rules. And if you want to watch a movie that'll bring a tear to your eye, I think it's it's either 92 or 93, Godzilla versus Mothra. Check it out. That movie is great. I love it. Uh, it's fantastic. So check that out. It's one of my favorite uh, movies. Now, people are probably wondering, when, when are you going to get to the actual like, like topic at hand? To reboot or not to reboot, that is a question. Well, it's funny you all answer or wonder or want to know because I'm going to do it right now. And this last letter for today comes from Mark Cote. Mark Cote writes, Mark Cote is a longtime member of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. He might not be here in the chat rooms. But he's written a few letters, and he's always got something interesting to say. And today is no different. Hi, Rob. First, I'd like to say that while I rarely catch the show live, I do try and listen to it when I can. The letters from your viewers continue to interest me, as does your well-considered response to them. On to the content of this letter. I've heard many a wish for this or that property to be rebooted, remade, reimagined. I can certainly understand the desire... So many of us have fond memories of our childhood favorites, be they TV shows, movies, or novels. The problem I have with trying to bring them back is twofold. So many of these properties are products of their time. In order to make them today, you might have to reimagine them to the extent that they would be unrecognizable. At that point, you might as well just come up with new ideas. Also, a lot of these old movies and shows are, well, let's be honest, not nearly as good as we remember them to be. To illustrate, a while back I tried watching some of the original Battlestar Galactica, a show I quite enjoyed as a young teenager when it first aired. While I felt a touch of nostalgia, I quickly came to the realization that it was kind of, well, terrible might be a bit harsh. So let's just say, not great. The 2004 version was, in my opinion, much better. Yet it divided the fan base, with some calling it a travesty, the way it crapped on the original. Have these people seen the original version recently? The second problem I have with the idea of modern remakes is itself twofold and concerns 
the high mucky mucks in Hollywood. So often it seems they don't get what made a show or movie popular. Like the idea that since Logan did well, it must mean that all such movies need to be rated R. Sigh. No, Hollywood, that's not why Logan was great. With that in mind, it does not surprise me when a remake focuses on the wrong thing, giving us something that might superficially resemble the original, but fails to connect with fans of that earlier property. The other issue is that Hollywood, with their trendy blinders on, might decide that a property needs to be modernized for a contemporary audience. That, in itself, isn't a problem, but it can become one when the focus is on today's issues. By the time the property comes out a year or two later, the world may have moved on, and we just don't care much about those issues or headlines anymore. Instead of a movie or show that feels timeless, what we get can become yet another outmoded or tired cliche, particularly as the news cycle is ever shortening along with our attention spans. In conclusion, I'm not sure there is a formula for resurrecting old properties, and on the whole, I'm not sure we should. Let those old favorites lie dormant, save for our fond memories of them. Give your audience something truly new to pique our interest. Regards, Mark Cote. First of all, uh, what a great letter. I love this letter. I love what Mark had to say. And I, I'm constantly grappling with the idea of remakes and reboots and changing things. And it's been interesting because I think it all comes down to who makes this decision of why to reboot these things and why in the first place do they need or do we have to reboot them? Why? It really comes down to why. Now, Hollywood is very risk averse. And the reason that they like reboots is because it's a known property. It's, it's something that is less risky because it has name recognition than something no one's ever heard of before, period. If Would you rather invest in something that already has a built-in knowledge base or somebody understanding uh, what's available or what it, what's going to be coming? Or would you, would you want to spend your money on something that people didn't know what it was? Because it's harder. You have to spend more money to market. Uh, the problem with that is frequently the the people that work in the studios and I know I I worked in at as people knew know I worked a long time ago at, in Warner Brothers feature production for the senior vice president of production Bill Young now physical production which is sort of funny physical production was down a rung on the ladder from the people that are making the creative decisions at the studio the senior vice president presidents that are picking the material that is going to be made uh, the feature production department, even though they're in charge of spending all the money, <laughs> which is funny, uh, they were lesser than, say, the the creative execs. that they, they just were. They were implementing policy. They were not making policy. <laughs> and, and it's kind of like being, my boss was was like Douglas McCar MacArthur. He was a general, but he had to enact the policy of the president. And I guess the Congress or whatever. But the people that make the decisions about what to make then don't end up being the ones who actually have to implement whatever it is they've decided to do. Frequently, it's that's not the case. Now, in the case of a Battlestar Galactica reboot, many people have tried. Famously, Brian Singer, and uh, w w he was involved before 9-11 curtailed uh, that, that, that uh it wasn't even going to be a reboot. It was going to be a continuation, much like Superman Returns was kind of a continuation of the of the uh, franchise uh, of Donner's Superman movies. But uh, then Ron Moore and David Icke had a take on Battlestar Galactica. And what's interesting is, I agree. Look, I watched every episode of Battlestar Galactica when it was on. A lot of it was cheesy. A lot of it didn't work. And a lot of it, even when you go back and you watch the pilot, all of humanity is decimated, but then they find a casino planet run by the Ovions, and they're like, oh, let's chill out here for a while. They got food and gambling and hot girls and two two-mouthed singers, and it, it just didn't work, ultimately. It worked at the time because people were coming off of Star Wars fever, and as a kid like myself, I wanted more galactic warfare. But Battlestar Galactic had a few good episodes. Uh, there was a few 
good episodes, and there was a lot of interesting stuff in it. Most of it was just taken from other war movies or other science fiction shows. It was never that good. But the premise was really interesting. The destruction of humanity by the very things that they created that had achieved some kind of, of free will sentience, if you were, if you will. I mean, the Cylons. That idea, the idea in Battlestar Galactica was irresistible. But since they are they're they are taking a, a pre-existing franchise with the name, they have to have some kind of they didn't totally reimagine it, but they took the things that everybody liked. The design of the Battlestar Galactica, the idea of war fighter pilots and the military, and and they kept all of the cool stuff, the the 12 colonies, and the idea that there was this machine uprising. All of that stuff worked. But when it was done in the 70s and 78, it was not done in a very sophisticated way. It was done in a very rudimentary, television of the time way. And then when they came up with the idea of doing Battlestar Galactica in the early aughts, they added a lot of really interesting wrinkles, such as the human beings were polytheists. They believed in the old gods, whereas the Cylons, the creation of man, were monotheists. They believed in the one true God. I mean, this was heady stuff. And Glenn Larson was, of course, I believe a Mormon. So there was a lot of Mormon ideology that was injected into the original Battlestar Galactica. So it's not like having religious uh, a religious bent to what was going on was not completely out of the realm of, it was not unheard of. But what they did with Battlestar Galactica was they updated it and they made it they made it really, really, really interesting. And they made it very viable. And they made it, uh, they took the core concepts, they retained the core concepts, and they made an infinitely better show that was far more nuanced, far more uh, sophisticated. And it was like nothing else that we'd seen on television. And it it, it immediately, it meet, it immediately became one of the greatest, if not the greatest science fiction television show to ever have been aired. And of course, it wasn't perfect. But I think what it does is it speaks to what makes a good reboot? When should something be rebooted? And I, I think it's the answer is simple. Something should be rebooted when a creative entity, whether that's a filmmaker or somebody that's actually going to have to implement policy, is going to actually make whatever it is, it's their take on the new property that makes it worth doing or their old property that makes it worth doing. So I'll give you one of my, there, there's a couple of, there's three great examples that I think I always cite them as the three great reboots or reimaginings. And there's more, but uh, the, to me, the, the, the trifecta was Philip Kaufman's Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 78, John Carpenter's The Thing, based on the John W. Campbell story, Who Goes There, in 82, and David Cronenberg's remake of The Fly in 86. All three of those movies were reimaginings of the core concepts in grand fashion. The closest to the original was, of course, Philip Kaufman's 2000, or 1978 version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, but with the added spin of 70s help, self-help culture. And if you haven't seen the original 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers, it's one of the finest science fiction and horror films ever made. It hasn't dated hardly at all, aside from some of the social stuff you'll see. But it is... What's incredible about Invasion of the Body Snatchers, about Philip Coppins, first of all, it's scary as hell. It's really creepy and unnerving, but it's a movie that I love for the simple fact it's about an alien invasion of the Earth that has already happened when the movie starts. It's just the main characters don't know it yet because it hasn't reached them. And it is an amazing exercise in paranoia. It is a brilliant brilliant movie now it's not too different the pod people the these alien plants that replace humans and they were grown in seed pods and it's an, a, an amazing movie you've got to check it out it's really great if you've never seen it and the first movie you know from the 50s same as it's funny because all of those movies i think the fly is the 50s but all three of these movies were 50s films like the thing the james arness the thing from another world uh, the the John Carpenter's The Thing goes back to the shape-shifting elements of the original story, total reimagining of the original short story, but but it, it, unlike, you know, The Thing, the original Thing from Another World, it's basically a man shambling around 
Whereas modern effects technology, well, it was modern in 1982, even though I still think it's amazing. Um, the, the, the technology that was employed, the story, the paranoia, again, was done so well in, in Carpenter's The Thing from 82, from the summer of 82. That opened the same day as Blade Runner, by the way. Uh, it, it was amazing. It was amazing and very much worth worthwhile. Then we get to, of course, four years later, Cronenberg's reinventioning or reimagining of The Fly. A lot of the same elements, but the whole idea is you're now watching instead of somebody turning into a man with a fly's head, you know, you're watching the gradual transformation of a man whose humanity is being torn away from him and and going nuts. And it could be an allegory like Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis, if you haven't read that book. Uh, it, it, and these are these are reimaginings and reboots that have a reason to live, a reason to exist. And I think that those are the best kind of of reimaginings the best the best way to do something now uh i want to go back and i wanted to read um uh a couple of uh super chats that i missed from yesterday and um they were let's see uh, i have them here they were from both of them were from square wheel and uh Square Wheel sent me one yesterday and one today in my ill-fated original chat that was going to happen at noon. So Square Wheel from yesterday asks, are you getting lighting for your display cabinet? Yes. I just, again, I, I have not. Those those display cabinets actually have lights in them. You can kind of see that there's a light there and they have lights on the top. The fuses are burned out. These these glass cases were old. They were, I got them in the mid-aughts. I got them in 2004. But I need to light them up. And um, I, I put backing on this one, on this side. And I'm going to put back in here and I'm going to light them up with digital lights. I'm going to light everything up here. I just haven't done it yet. And I haven't even arranged my figures. I mean, these two shelves are, are arranged, but like, you know, poor Thanos is living down here. And there was Gilbert, everyone coming through and Bane. And actually, I have a bootleg Morgan Freeman figure here. I haven't even decided. Should I make this Star Wars and this all Marvel? I, I can't decide. I, I need to get on it. Square Wheel also says from today, earlier today Battlestar Galactica does not need a reboot well it already is a reboot and I don't think it does either they keep trying to make a movie I don't think they could ever do Galactica better than it was done you know, with the 2004 the David Icke uh, Ron Moore series uh, Battlestar Galactica does not need a reboot however I believe Buck Rogers would benefit from one I hope they never do one for Back to the Future well Square Wheel they I, I agree with you I think that uh, they should never do one for Back to the Future I think that's lame Back to the Future is a pretty perfect movie uh, but again they'll probably do it at some point uh, but I hope not but you know again I, I, I don't mind reboots when they're done well what's really interesting is I felt the 2009 Star Trek, which was absolutely a reboot, redoing Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. I've always said, if you're going to go back and do that, make it. I would have gone further. I would have done. I would have gone much further than they did. What they did was was they made Star Trek light and they made it very superficial and they dumbed it down. That's what I hated. I mean, Battlestar Galactica was not a dumbed down show. It started out dumb. The original was kind of dunderheaded, even though I liked it. But the Galactica 2004 version was incredible. Westworld, if you go back and you watch the original 1973 Michael Crichton film, very respectable movie about robots running amok and what happens. But look, as whether you love the Westworld or not, the new Westworld, the HBO Westworld, I think it's a little portentous and pretentious, but it certainly delves into very interesting issues. And it's, it's, it's a heady show. Uh, and I do appreciate that. I think Westworld's the greatest or the best kind of reboot. And here is Gilbert. Would you like to come up here, Gilbert? You haven't been here in a while. You're welcome to come. Would you like a cookie? Since Gilbert is here, and uh, Tallulah, you know, Tallulah is is never leaves him alone. He'll here, Gilbert. If you'd like a cookie, come on up. You want to come up? Want to get up? There you go, buddy. Here's Gilbert, everyone. He hasn't been on the show for a while. And uh, he gets he, everyone likes when Gilbert is here. He's been running ragged or run ragged with poor Tallulah. Look at that, huh? What do you think about that, buddy? You yeah, buddy. Oh, here's Tallulah. Everyone, you want to come up too? You want to come up here? You gonna get up? Come on, get up. Come up. Come up. No, oh, you gotta come up. Here, come up. Come up. Oh, can you get up? Can you get up? Cool. Oh. 
I don't know if you can see Tallulah. Look at this. She's moving in on your Mac. Oh, well. Look at He just took her cookie. You don't want your sister to have a cookie? I'll give Tallulah a cookie. Here you go, Tallulah. No, buddy. No, have Tallulah have a cookie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, the two of them are an endless source of, uh, they really are an endless source of hilarity. Okay, buddy. Got to get down. Now, you guys go. Good girl. Do you want to come up here? Come up and see everybody. Here, everyone. This is Tallulah, the new, uh, the new, Tallulah is an Irish doodle. She is 50% Irish doodle and 50%, or she's 50% Irish setter and 50% poodle. Right, and she needs a bath, and she needs a, a shave. Would you like a cookie, Tallulah? Tallulah, would you like a cookie? This, this girl clearly rules the roost, and uh, Gilbert loves her, and they're never apart, are they? All right, you can have one more cookie. Then you have to get down. Yes. Yeah. This is a good cookie. I never get tired of listening. You know, listening to her chewing on these things on headphones is great. All right, you got to get down now. Good girl. Good girl. Yeah, Tallulah. So anyway, uh, I don't even know where I was. The dogs come and interrupt me, but they're a part of the show. Uh, ooh, Travis Rayner asks, what did you think of the RoboCop reboot? You know... I, I thought the RoboCop reboot wasn't horrible, but again, I, I felt like they didn't do enough. It, 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 did it reinvent the concept enough to warrant being rebooted? It felt like it just smacked of, look, all reboots are commercial. I understand that. Everybody wants to make money. But I just feel like the original RoboCop is such a an achievement in fantasy filmmaking. And it really, it did such a great job that I think that the new RoboCop didn't do enough. What they needed was more of a Battlestar Galactica take on it and really, really drill down into what that what that meant. And I think that they didn't they didn't they didn't do a good uh, a good job doing that. Roberto Suarez says it will take me approximately 24 years to watch 5,000 hours worth of movies at a rate of two movies per week. Have fun. Well, you know what's cool about that? What's cool about that is, is that if I did that now, I think 24 years would, would put me at 76, which is I always thought I would die around that age. So if I start now, but the funny thing is, is I keep buying physical media. What I should do is like, I should have a contest or something. I uh, But you know, kids today, you kids today, you don't have physical media. You don't collect Blu-rays or anything. And I, 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 I'm all excited about getting 4K discs of like The Shining, but how many times am I going to watch The Shining? That's really interesting. I mean, my buddy Bill Hunt's got like 20,000, 25,000 discs. That's really interesting. 24 years to watch 5,000 hours worth of movies at a rate of two movies per week. I feel that there's so many movies I haven't seen that I should only spend the rest of my life watching things I haven't seen and, and collecting. It's really weird. Like, I've been talking to my mom and she's, you know, she's 80. You can watch her when I interviewed her for her birthday, but she talks about, you know, she's like, well, you can have my collection of Yadro, you know, these figures that were made in Spain. And it's, it's weird to hear somebody talking like that, but I guess I'm going to have to feel that way. I mean, who's going to care about all my, you know, these figures when I'm dead, people are going to be like, why did he collect those in the first place? That's really interesting. <laughs> 24 years to watch 5,000, to watch 5,000 hours. <laughs> that's uh that's that's kind of a bummer um that's interesting to note square wheel keeps coming back at me i love that square wheel thank you very much for supporting the channel carpenter is my favorite director so many memories from my youth are entangled with those movies i agree man i always said i wanted to be a cross between stanley kubrick john carpenter and um david cronenberg and nobody would see that in free enterprise but that's what i always said i wanted to be i i'm a huge carpenter fan uh i watch his movies incessantly and uh not just the thing but you know all of his movies i've a dark star funny enough dark star the vci vhs tape of dark star was the second videotape i ever owned after Mita, before it became media the Mita release of halloween on vhs so not only do i love john carpenter so much but i have uh, uh, those are the first two pre-recorded movies I ever owned were two of his movies. Uh, Mark C asks any, a uh, fan film creator, James Colley was working on a retro looking remake of Buck Rogers. Any idea what happened? 
I don't know what happened, but you know, as James probably found out, it's really difficult to make something that's original. I have to take these little cookies back so the dogs won't come and jump on them and eat them. So it's tough. I mean, you know, the the <laughs> the Buck Rogers with Gil Gerard is not exactly high art, but to make something original, it's tough and expensive. I mean, look at what um, Mark Scott Sacree did with Space Command. That was not exactly the easiest thing to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I, I think reboots. Look, there there are reboots that, reboots of movies. Like I love the original Norman Jewison's original 1975 Rollerball. I love it. And John McTiernan remade Rollerball. John McTiernan, the man who directed The Predator, Die Hard, Hunt for or not The Predator. He directed Predator, The Predator with Shane Black. But he directed Hunt for Red October. He even directed the Thomas Crown Affair. But Rollerball is god awful. The remake of Rollerball is really bad. Tim Burton's remake of, of Planet of the Apes, not so good. I love the the new trilogy of the Apes movies, but you know it just didn't didn't work. And it's it's sort of sad when you see reboots that you wonder like what happened. And and I think what it, it's important. What happens is I'll tell you what happens. A studio like 20th Century Fox, they look into their catalog or something, or Disney or, or Warner Brothers or whatever. They look, MGM looks back into their catalog and says, what can we take and remake? What can we remake? But when the studio is making the decision, then they have to go find some creative to slot into that, that place to go remake or reboot this thing. I think anybody that's going to remake something, reboot something, they have to be a creative that is already passionate about the remake. And I think we saw that in Cronenberg. We saw that in Philip Kaufman. And we saw that in John Carpenter making the thing. The creative himself or herself needs to be the person that's passionate about the reboot. If they're not, you will never come up with a great reboot. I mean, even the thing, the the when you find out what happened at the Norwegian station, that remake that came out in 2011 or or prequel, you know, it was going to be lots of physical effects. And then they went back and they went and made it CGI. I mean, it was just, it it, it never works. You, The only way you're going to get something truly magical, if you're going to reboot something, is you need to have a creative that has a take on it. I mean, how many interviews did I have to endure watching J.J. Abrams talk about how he didn't like Star Trek, that he loved Star Wars instead? Then why was he rebooting Star Trek? Why? It was a business decision. You know, it's like, ooh, you want to get our hands on this franchise. And we're still living with that business decision a decade later, and we're getting mediocre Star Trek. We should be getting amazing Star Trek that's delving into our current situation as far as our technology, where is it going to go? How are our lives going to change? I mean, we get instead B grade, Z grade uh, uh, computer villains, uh, AI villains that that a movie like Her is so much more sophisticated than Star Trek, and that's that's really kind of a bummer. And uh, yeah, Mark C says I love the remake of the Thomas Crown Affair better than the original. God bless Rene Russo. You know what? There's a there's I as much as I did like the original, I have to admit. John McTiernan's remake of the Thomas Brown Affair with Pierce Brosnan and Rene Russo is great. I love it. Powerhouse studio filmmaking. You know, when John McTiernan was firing on all cylinders, he was firing on all cylinders, and we got some great work. Uh, I can't recommend the Thomas Crown Affair enough. The original is good, but yeah. Oh, Just Plain Steve says, just a reminder to get started on Stargate SG-1. Also, I have watched Avatar. Have you watched Avatar the Last Airbender series? The, the I've watched the anime, which I really liked, and uh, I am going to watch the upcoming Netflix series. Uh, again, you know, one of the reboots, I guess it's a reboot because it takes place a thousand years later, is The Dark Crystal. I look at The Dark Crystal, and it looks like a loving creation that was made by people that are honoring the original but are going to continue the story. I mean, that looks amazing, and I'm in, uh, I can't believe that we're getting The Dark Crystal. Uh it's amazing to me that really that we are. It, it truly is. What an astonishing, what an astonishing world that we live in that we're getting that kind of a reboot. Um, amazing. Dan V900 says it's clear that John Connor dies in Dark Fate, where it's probably early. Would you consider that a betrayal of the franchise and James Cameron a liar since he said it continues John's story? Well. 
I'm not saying I know anything about the John Connor story in Terminator Dark Fate. But what happens is pretty definitive. And I'm sure that's where they came up with the name Dark Fate. Uh, I actually kind of like what I've heard, what maybe might happen in the new Terminator movie. Um, because, you know, we've seen John Connor dealt with how many times in the movies? So why not do something a little different? And after all, no fate but what we make. Um, but I think, Dan V900, you are not necessarily far off from what you are saying, at least from what I'm hearing. I, you know, I don't think it's a liar. I don't, it does continue his story because it takes place years later. And um, it, 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 it might not continue it the way we want to continue it. But I think they have to... Look, I wonder, as much as I saw at CinemaCon, those extended scenes and the new trailer, you know what it made me realize? It made me realize that we are... That maybe the story of, of the machines... Uh, Terminator is so quaint now after we've received everything from Blade Runner to the new Battlestar Galactica to Ex Machina to her, whatever. The idea of just the evil machines that want to exterminate mankind is a little played out. That there's more, I think, more interesting stories to tell that have more ramifications. I mean, even Westworld, you have a, a scene where at the end of season one, everyone gets slaughtered and things change uh, in season two. But it's it's the idea of a machine uprising seems just a little too one-dimensional now. And maybe the Terminator franchise feels that way because we've been getting it now for the better. We, man, the Terminator, Terminator, the movie, the original is 35 years old this year. 35 years old. And that vision of a future where Skynet exists is it just seems a little quaint. So you know, I don't know. I I I think why not do Terminator because there's obviously still money to be made in the franchise with James Cameron coming back. But I just, I don't know if it's worth, I mean, we're going to get it regardless. I hope it's good. But I don't think it's a lie. I don't necessarily think it's a lie if James Cameron says it continues John Connor's fate and his fate is, is, is <laughs> we find out about it early on. Uh, let's just put it that way. But I do think like, I, I again, it all comes down to is the new idea interesting? Can they reinvent the idea for, like in, in Mark Cote's letter, he talks about that a lot of these concepts are, are of their time. And look at look at Shakespeare's stories. Shakespeare's stories are, are timeless. Now, we don't recognize the lands in which they took place, but whether you're talking about something like Merchant of Venice, or you're talking about Othello, or you're talking about Romeo and Juliet, we've seen those stories Richard, uh, Ian McKellen's Richard III. I think King Lear is coming out, a modern take on King Lear where they, they update the setting but tell the story. I think that's those are always valid. I mean, I've always said that Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet is sort of the Blade Runner of Shakespeare adaptations. I think that, that timeless stories can always be reinvented and presented for the modern age if I love Julie Tamor's Titus, her film about, you know, her version of Titus Andronicus. Uh, as long as the creators have interesting ways to present them. You know, it all comes down to that. The problem is now, risk averse Hollywood would much rather reboot or remake. Look, even The Handmaid's Tale that's on, that's on Hulu is great, but that's a reboot as well. There was a movie that was based on Margaret Atwood's book. And I think the, the Handmaid's Tale TV series is, is incredible. The movie was okay. Um, I really enjoyed Steven Soderbergh's version of the uh, his adaptation of Stanislaw Lem's novel Solaris. I love the Tarkovsky version, but it's uh, but but Steven Soderbergh's version is different than the Tarkovsky version. I mean, they share a lot of the same DNA, but I liked it. I thought it was good, you know. And 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 you had a creator who was passionate. He worked with James Cameron on that as well. And my buddy Chuck Bender was one of the producers on that film. Uh, college roommate of mine. And, and I think that, um, you know, again, it comes down to the creative and it comes down to the vision for the property. Do they have something new to say that can add something to the property? Studio execs are just going to say, what do we have in our catalog we can remake? Let's go remake that. Their decisions are not usually based on a creative coming to the studio and saying, hey, I'd love to redo this because a creative executive is going to be like, um, I don't trust you. I'd rather sit back and have other people at the studios confer, but 
I think we get the best results and the worst results, actually, when creatives that are passionate about something want to remake it. The new Star Trek, to me, is a perfect example of something that was rebooted by a creative that wasn't necessarily passionate about the project and went the safe, easy way the entire time, and we got basically something that was dumbed down for the masses. And the reason the Star Trek movies, the, the bad robot Star Trek movies, did not catch on is because they did not add anything new to that franchise. They didn't reinvent it. Whereas it, Star Trek needed a Battlestar Galactica reimagining. We certainly didn't get it with Discovery because they wanted to have their cake and eat it too. Oh, it's not a reimagining. It takes place canonically in the same time, but it really doesn't. I think Star Trek is a cautionary tale on how to not reboot something, actually, at least the last 10 years of Star Trek. Dan V900 says, I know what happens with Arnold's character in the movie where it is unexpected and really interesting, but it will be controversial. I loved the show. The Sarah Connor Chronicles, I thought were very, very good, if that's what you're talking about. Yes, what happens with Arnold's character in this new Terminator is going to be controversial, but that's good. It shakes it up. I think it's really interesting if, if what I know happens happens it'll be really interesting and see how they've 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 done a good job doing something new i think they what they're going to do with that arnold character is really really interesting uh, i'm very excited about it victory unlimited is here the victory unlimited show is here i love when victory unlimited is here and he's always very generous in supporting the channel so thank you sir the value of physical versus digital media is that there are many great old movies that i own that'll probably that That'll probably never be made available to me in the future via a streaming service. Example, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis's movie collection. I agree. And I'll tell you one of the problems with all of that is if you were to ask somebody, here, here I'll tell you a funny story. I've told this story before. So when I was working on Disney, when I was working, I was working for a company called Curdy Pellerin, Michael Pellerin and Jeff Curdy's company. And they had a great company, and they were making most of all of the Disney Laserdiscs, and then they transitioned over to work on Disney Special Edition uh, DVDs. And while I worked for them, I was tasked with making the a documentary about the making of Tron. This was in 19, or 2002 for the 20th anniversary of, of, of Tron. And Disney didn't much care about the Tron release on DVD because they had done polling they had polled mothers with children five and younger, and they had asked them, are you excited for the release of Tron on DVD? Because they were trying to figure out what catalog titles did they should they put out early in the DVD run. Of course, nobody. The mother said, we're not at all interested in the release of Tron on DVD. And of course, anyone like us who knew the property would say, of course, you have a whole world of gamers and people that have grown up with Tron. Tron is a big deal. And I, I made a feature length, I directed a feature length documentary that's on the Blu-ray, it was on the DVD, on the making of Tron. It's pretty academic. I was going for a living Cinefix article. But Tron ended up being their largest selling catalog title, the double disc DVD, the 20th anniversary DVD, was the largest selling catalog title of 2002 for Disney. Now, this was surprising to them. But the problem is you don't have anybody that was working at the studio that knows the importance of Tron. Didn't make that leap. Well, gamer culture, video games had exploded. We had Nintendo and we had PlayStation then, and they were huge. And you have a whole new culture of gamers, both guys and girls, and they look back and they know Tron. But you ask a woman, you a studio executive who doesn't know this, and most of them don't know these things. They rely on polling or they rely on research, internal and external research. They don't know anything, so they didn't know Tron was going to sell. Well, now you have no one. There's nobody working at the studios that really know anything about their back catalog. Unfortunately, though, in the case of the, in the, case of the Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis movie collection, no one knows that Martin and Lewis used to be a thing. Nobody knows that they made a number of movies together and they were a successful team. They have been forgotten by history. And before you get mad at me, Victory Unlimited, you have to admit that it's not like millennials or Generation Z is growing up clamoring for Martin and Lewis's movies, nor are they clamoring for Hope and Crosby movies either. A lot of our cultural legacy, our pop culture legacy is a product of its time. So we're never, ever going to see this stuff come back. 
Now, even if it's preserved, which unfortunately, these are all things that were shot on negative, so it costs money to preserve them, somebody has to foot that bill. And unfortunately, the actual sad reality of life is putting things like Martin and Lewis's films out or Hope and Crosby's films out on Blu-ray, for instance, on HD, is expensive. Uh, I'm trying to get Free Enterprise to put Free Enterprise out on 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 HD is a lot of money. And, you know, I'd love to do it. I'd love to buy back the negative from, from our executive producer who owns it. But even the however much that would cost me to do, it's a it's $150,000 prospect just to transfer and clean the negative up and the special features and do what I want to do just to get the film onto 4K, much less put it out in any format. So it's very expensive. And who's going to foot the bill for that? And unfortunately, we don't have, like, I think that we should have a preservation of the modern arts. I think that part of our tax dollars should go to that. I think the the amount of money we spend on the military, I mean, we should have a billion dollars a year to preserve the, our media arts, and we don't. And unfortunately, there's no money to be made. If the studios can't make money, why would they preserve the films? I mean, I hate to say it. It's not really what I want to see, but it's just the reality of the world that we live in. And the only way to do that is if things are then rebooted, then it gives you an, a, a reason to put oh, we can make a new transfer of the old thing because we're rebooting the new thing and hopefully the, the interest in the new thing will generate interest in the old thing and make money. Look, I think it should all be preserved. I have a friend that was over here earlier today that was talking about what are they putting on Disney Plus? And he's working on Disney Plus. And it's very, I'm not going to say what they're putting on, but it was interesting to hear. I was asking about certain things that they were or weren't going to be able to put on. Like I was like, the Mickey Mouse Club. And of course, the Mickey Mouse Club has a lot of legalities surrounding it, which make it difficult to put on, even for Disney, to put out. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what they do and don't preserve. And then the thing is, once they put these things on Disney+, Plus, even if they go back and do things like Davy Crockett, nobody knows who Fess Parker's Davy Crockett was now. You know, they just don't. And, and when you put it on there, are people going to watch that? People will eventually discover it, but it's just never going to make money. And and that's kind of kind of a, a, a super bummer, to be honest. A real bummer. Um, uh, Movie Maniac 86 says Disney should release Earth Star Voyager on Blu-ray. Well, they should release everything on Blu-ray. Well, it'll be interesting to see if they do. Um, I don't know if they will. Uh, Dax Jacobson says the digital scanners for old films have gotten cheaper. No idea. On the software you need to run it but it's not just running the transfers it's also cleaning the negative you've got to take proper care of the negative then you have to color correct the negative there's a lot of labor uh, very labor intensive to do that and that's the problem um robert uh captain robert april asks doesn't the nea have a role in media preservation they might but we don't even live in a world where our education is valued uh much anymore and um, Earth Star Voyager, yeah, that's, I keep going back to that. Uh, it's it's sad, but also the problem is, unfortunately, is once you've preserved these things and put them out, is anyone going to watch them? That's the other thing. That's the other part of the equation. Are people going to watch this stuff? And as I've talked about on the show before, unfortunately, I think the shelf life of of pop culture, even movies, unless they're the bona fide classics, unless you know you're in the pantheon of classics. Most of the movies that have been made and come out are relegated to the scrap heap of history. Even Disney, they're not preserving. Where's Splash on Blu-ray? Although I've heard Splash is going to be on Disney+. Plus. Where is, where, where is our cultural legacy? Disney, down and out in Beverly Hills. You know, that movie's not available. The, the, the Kino Lorber, uh, Disney movies, they don't even want to remember they made those movies. And that's not part of what, they're, what they are um, preserving. So reboots on Matthew Goddard says the most anticipated sequel of my life lifetime was the last Jedi. So disappointed. I waited 35 years to see that. Well, you know, in my lifetime it was return of the Jedi. And I hated that when I first saw it, oh, I tolerate it now, but talking about disappointing for me. Uh, yeah. I mean, but it comes in film preservation. I think we need to preserve these things, but again, you know, who's going to watch them? Uh, I did uh, my Jim Boyers officer, Jim Boyers, uh, says he got to see Song of the South one time and never again. I did see Song of the South myself. As a matter of fact, I remember seeing it multiple times when I was a kid because they would show it 
at in our elementary school gymnasiums and you'd go on a Saturday and get popcorn. And I remember seeing that movie all the time. Um, and no one will ever see it again because of how it's been, um, how it's been sort of positioned in our culture. And, and I think it's, I think that movie's even been given a bad rap. It's not as bad as people think. And I think the people that, that I've talked to people, um, uh, I've talked to black friends of mine that grew up watching it. You know, their parents watched it and, and it was a favorite. And yet it's, it's, it's not considered, of course, politically correct anymore. Uh, speaking of rights, Cow Matrix says, Cow Matrix says, speaking of rights, what happened to the remaining seasons of The Muppet Show? Again, it's, I don't know. I don't know. It's tough to say. Uh, Farky50 says the effects in Tron were quite amazing, but I think they hand painted the cells like a Disney animation to add color. They did. Uh, they absolutely did do that. They made what are called Codalists. And you know what, Farky50, you should watch my feature length documentary I directed uh, on the making of Tron. And you will find a lot of that. It was good stuffs. Cousin Neil was here creating the Space Rob video game, but he's going to watch the MGA uh, NBA final. So that's um, that's uh, that's cool. Yes, Tron was the first movie that had CG uh, effects the way it did. You know, when they made Tron, they would just punch in numbers. And they didn't know how things were going to look until they had them scanned a 65 millimeter film. It was amazing. Jim Boyer says the original Ocean's Eleven is good because come on, it's the Rat Pack, but the remakes are much better. One of my favorite franchises. You know what? The original Ocean's Eleven, by the way, co-written by one of the men who wrote the novelization or wrote the novel of Logan's Run, George Pl Clayton Johnson. Um, the original uh, Ocean's Eleven is not good. I think the remake is actually much, much better. I really like those movies, especially the first and the third ones. I think they're great. The first one's, I think, terrific. A terrific movie. Uh, Matthew Goddard says, Lucas was on record that the 1080 scan was the master record for all time. Yeah, it's scary. Um. Yeah, so a bummer. It is a bummer. It's kind of a bummer. I, um, I, you know, I think everything should be available. I think every, everything should be available, and and we should preserve our cultural history, because the way it goes now, I mean, the the way I see some some things happening are 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 there are people in order to do what they do, trying to preserve the rights of others, and trying to protect people and protect the rights of of every individual they would get rid of much of our cultural legacy. And our cultural legacy should be kept and preserved for all time so we know where we've come from, where we've been, and where we should be going. And this idea that you're going to squelch human history for good or bad, and let's face it, most of human history is not so good. And if you're going to try and get rid of it all and pretend it didn't happen, we are not going to develop and move into the future the way we should. And that, my friends, is, I think, one of the most dangerous elements of, of what's going on today in our, in our culture wars. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have done this chat. I'm, I'm happy you guys waited and are still here. I'm going to jump off so people can go watch the NBA Finals and have dinner. I'm sorry this chat was so late. I, YouTube had some crazy outage. It was a Gmail outage. Kind of nuts. But anyway, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to remind everybody here that this chat is brought to you by Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products for those men who want to look good and feel great. And if you go to their website, getluckytiger.com, and you punch in PGS for Post Geek Singularity Community, you will get 20% off your order. And uh, I highly recommend their stuff. I love their facial scrub, and I do love their all-over body wash. I don't have a beard or a mustache, but they've got all this great these great elixirs, and I can't recommend them, recommend them highly enough. I use it all myself, and I thank them for their continued support. And I want to thank all of you who supported me. I want to thank my moderators, Terry, Jim, Greg Smith, and Mike Bodden, who aren't here. But uh, you guys do a great job, and I want to thank all of you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. If you like these chats, please subscribe. Please click like on the video itself, because apparently I haven't even delved into why this is important. I've just been told I got a message that it's important. YouTube wants me to make sure people are liking these videos. And I will be back tomorrow on the John Campia Show at 9 a.m. and back in the afternoon. And this week, June 4th, is my 31st anniversary of living in L.A. It's my 20th anniversary of the theatrical release of Free Enterprise. And it is also the 
the what what it is the 37th anniversary of Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan. That happens on the 4th of June. So I want to thank you all for being here. And remember, every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. All you have to do is listen. Keep sending me letters at thebrunettework.net. I love them. And as always, remember, have a better day. <laughs>